Hey everyone, welcome to this special edition of the Business of Sports Show. I call it special because we have one of the greats of the game of rugby with us today. We have none other than All Blacks legend, Sean Fitzpatrick. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be with you. I, I apologise for my, my, my look. Um, I'm not normally a, a beard wearer like yourself, uh, but I'm currently in New Zealand. We're in, uh, in quarantine at the moment. Uh, we're day nine of 14. Um, so I've sort of let my, let my beard go a bit, actually. But that's not, not Relax bad, a bit. You know, fellow, 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 fellow beard wearer. Exactly. It's, it's in keeping with the show, so it's all good. So, Sean, for, for the one or two people out there who may not know who you are, because, as I said, you are an absolute legend of the game. Do you want to give us a bit of background on, on yourself? Who are, who are you and what have you actually done? <laughs> um, well, my name is Sean Fitzpatrick. I, I played for the All Blacks for 11 years, from uh, 1986 to 1997, 98. I retired in 98, uh, last game in 90. Uh, 97, which is a good Trivial Pursuits question, actually, which was against Wales at uh, Wembley in London, because uh, they were building the Millennium Stadium. And uh, I played, I'm All Black number 871, played 127 times for the All Blacks, 92 internationals, 51 as captain, uh, from 92 to 97. Um, which I, even just saying this myself, Matt, you, you may just think this is, you know, this is normal, but I, I still I still look back and think, Christ, I never thought I'd be an all black. And then I can just reel reel off those numbers. Uh, yeah. so I'm I'm very privileged. Um, I belong to a great a great club. Um, we have a great legacy. Um, you know, once an all black, always an all black. And um, uh, you know, my father was an all black in the fifties. Um, he unfortunately for dad who passed away <laughs> 10, 10 odd years ago he, he was involved in the last all black team that lost to the Welsh and, and we might talk about that a bit later uh, <laughs> but, but dad dad never got over that he never went never went back to Wales <laughs> um, brilliant but I, I just I, I just I, I grew up in Auckland uh, where, where we are now and had a had a really normal upbringing in the 60s and 70s we're you know we're very much the, the area where I was sort of brought up was very community based around the rugby club very much like like the Scarlets and you know our life revolved around that Saturday at, at the rugby club and you know as I said I was I never thought I'd be an all black I just I dreamt of being an all black and as 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 all blacks we say every man and boy would change places with you tomorrow and I, I was no different I was I'm the youngest of, of four children and I had an older brother and uh, two older sisters. Uh, so I was the, the baby of the family. Uh, so that sort of, that hardened me up, I think, uh, in terms of, <laughs> of, of my upbringing. And, you know, I just, I had natural ability, Matt, but I, I didn't really realize that, that ability until I was about 20 years old. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, the rest is history. But very true. And, and what, what a history it is. I mean, the first question I've got to ask you, do you miss playing? I, I don't miss playing. Actually. A lot of people ask me that, actually, and I haven't put a pair of boots on since that day at, at Wembley in 97 in terms of playing playing boots. Um, yeah. Because when you're an all black, Matt, um, it takes everything out of your life. Your whole focus is on being an all black. Um, so you need to be really dedicated to that if you want to survive and if you want to be part of the All Blacks, and that's a, it's a big decision. And, and you need to make sure you surround yourself. And I, I'm very fortunate that um, I've got a, a loving wife who, who was so supportive right through. We, we started going out at, at university. And that was before I was an All Black. And yeah. we've, we've been on this journey right through. And it's been very much a, a team effort. In terms of, I'm talking about my rugby career, and then then the children came along; they got involved in it, um, because you know to be successful in, in in anything you do, really, there's there's two key ingredients, and and and, and the first one is preparation. The best prepared people in the world win, yep. and nine times out of ten, and unfortunately, with that degree of preparation, preparation comes sacrifice, 
And and as an all black, you have to make sacrifices. You know, it has yeah. to it has to be the most important thing in your life. And and unfortunately, the the family in most cases will will come second. And and you need the support mechanisms around you that that understand that. So to answer your question, no, I, I don't miss it because I had eleven brilliant years. Uh, playing for the All Blacks, it was uh, you know the proudest moment of my life when I, I became an All Black in, in June 1986. Um, but at the end of the day, I had a I had a great run. God, 11 years playing for the All Blacks, a hugely successful period in the All Blacks. Right. Um, but when that stopped, and I must say it was hard to let go. I had a knee injury, which sort of forced me to to stop because I, I don't think I would have stopped because it's hard to let go of something that you 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 cherish and to, to finally let go and take the kids to school, put the rubbish out, mow the lawns, unpack your toilet bag. Um, yep. All those things which, which we all take for granted in, in normal life. Um, you know, being at a school concert, um, wedding anniversaries, all, all those sort of things, you just had to sacrifice. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I had, a, as I said, I had a, had a wonderful career, loved every moment of it, but I'm, I'm loving the stage of, you know, the next chapter in my life. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I was going to ask you about the whole sacrifice element because I, I, I you know, in the run up to all this, my preparation, my research, you know, I read about yeah. you know, what you had to kind of miss in terms of, you know, the kids growing up and, and you know, some moments with them, you know, we, when looking back now, how you know, do you feel the journey was worth kind of missing those things for 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 that experience with the All Blacks? Yeah, I've got I've got, I've got no no regrets at all, Matt. Uh, you know, I think I think maybe in the in the first part of my career we were, you know, from eighty seven or eighty six through to to ninety we were unbeatable. You know, we, we no one could get anywhere near us. You know, we we you know. Um, you know, against Wales, we toured Wales and Ireland in '89. We toured, toured Australia in '88. Um, you know, we won won games at, at ease. You know, un, unfortunately, in, in uh, the second test in, in Ballymore in '88, we we drew, which was like a national disaster. We were like, "Wow, what has happened?" It was a little bit of a yeah. wake up call. Um, but I think you know, once again, I had natural ability. And I, and I think that maybe I could have been better then. Um, because yeah. definitely in the second half of my career, when I got a massive kick on the backside in '91, uh, when we when we got beaten in Dublin, um, and I, I thought I was the best best hooker in the world, and little did I know, you know, Phil Kearns was actually a much better hooker than me, and and it took that massive kick on the backside, and then a, a new All Black coach telling me that I was fat and lazy and arrogant and take, took my position for granted and lost the respect of the All Black jersey and all these things, I was like, my God bloody hell and it was a massive wake-up call for me and I became fitter faster stronger um, being made captain it made me analyze oppositions uh, analyze my own performance uh, look at diversity within the team how the different cultures could work together to get a better result all, the, all these things that that I haven't even hadn't even thought of um, but it definitely made me a better player and I always say to people, it made me a better person, uh, which is which is key. And and I'm sure you've heard that you know good people make great teams, and that's definitely the case in the All Blacks. So you mentioned about you know, becoming captain. Now, now there's one thing to be made captain of a team, but I think there's there's another thing to be made captain of the All Blacks, given the the fearsome history and reputation, and even the win percentage as well. That's got to add extra pressure onto the whole situation yeah. of, of you know, of having the weight of a nation, not not just kind of any nation, but a, a rugby living, breathing nation like New Zealand's, where literally the captain of the All Black is the pinnacle. That that had to, yeah, had to think... kind of weigh on your shoulders. They didn't matter, especially because I didn't really want to be All Black captain either. It was just literally literally really? no one else, I think. And, you know, we had, a, we had a, a massive, a lot of changes in 92 with uh, the new coach coming in, Laurie Maines, and we'd lost the World Cup in 91 and, you know, in the semi-final. And a lot of 
a lot of some of my, you know, the greatest All Blacks that I played with um, weren't selected. Um, I was lucky to be given an opportunity. And um, it happened to be our centenary year also, which added added to the pressure. Yeah. And and literally I was I was made the captain and it was a it was a huge burden. I I I didn't enjoy it. And and I and I, I was trying to be I, I'd look at some of these great all black captains and you know the Brian Lahores of the world, the, the you know, the, the David Kirks and the Buck Shelfords and Gary Wetton and all these all black captains that I'd played with and gone before me. And and I, I thought, God, I'm not I'm not like them. I, I can't speak as well as them. I, I don't hold the, the team like they do. Um, I don't think about the game like they do. So <laughs> I, I tried to, to be like them. And, and I, I always remember the, the night before we played um, Ireland in Dunedin in 1992, I think it was about my third or fourth test as captain. And uh, the most beautiful manager I ever had was a guy called John Sturgeon, who, who, who managed us uh, through, through the 80s. And he knocked on my door. He's a coal miner from the West Coast. And we were playing in Dunedin and he came down. And he knocked on my door and, and, and it was standing in the door. I was Sturge. And he said, Fitzy, he said, I'd like to have a cup of tea with you. I said, yeah, come in, Sturge. I said, I'm, I'm rooming by myself because that's what the captains do. And I, I don't really like that. Uh, yeah. So come in and we'll share a cup of tea. And he said to me, he said, Fitzy, he said, are you enjoying this all black gig? And I said, Sturge, no, nah, I'm not enjoying it at all. He said, you know why you're not enjoying it? I said, please tell me. He said, because you're not being yourself. He said, just be yourself. And that was probably the best advice I ever got. And, you know, I led by example. I was very much a, in, in my early time captaining was the Buck Shelford sort of mold, lead by example, yeah. which I, I loved. That's what I loved about playing under, under Buck. Um, because he just led by example, didn't say much, didn't need to. He led led by his actions, and 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 that was sort of the the turning point, really. And and I think ultimately, Matt, you know, as as you get older, um, being yourself is so important in life. And and it's the one thing that's you know, in terms of what we're going through now with this pandemic, and it's really important that you be yourself, because um, being yourself, you're happy. Uh, if you're happy in your own skin, uh, it's really, really important um, to express yourself, who you are. Uh, don't be ashamed of where you come from or, or your deficiencies or, or you know, yeah, we're, we're to become better in some areas, you know, and that's, that's what I had to do. Um, you know, I had to, I had to look at all different, different angles of, of, of how I could be a, a better captain. Yeah, and, and, and you often see that that burden of captaincy um, affects the players, um, you know, the way they actually play because they're, they're, they're busy thinking about the team, that they're not thinking about their performance. And that means they're not leading by example, they're not being themselves. And, and yeah, there, there are so many, there's probably no, no true, true words there apart about being yourself um, because you have to. Because, yeah, I think and, also, I mean, Matt, I th yeah. I think it's really important also, and this is you know something with age that you get that you you need to create a safe environment where where people can express themselves and and not be afraid to to delegate, you know, to yeah. to say to Robin Brook, you know, Robin, I want you to take over the line outs. I want that is your responsibility. And you know, uh, you look after the defensive line outs, Ian Jones, you look after the the attack line outs. Uh, Zinni, I want you to look after all, all the set piece moves around the scrum. Um, and don't be afraid. I, I was never afraid that they were going to take my job. And, and, yeah. and if they did, they, they, they could have it. But it was about collaboration, putting everyone together. Um, and as I said, creating a safe environment where, where people can express themselves, where they can put their hand up. Andrew Mertens. You know, when he got on the All Blacks in 95, you know, I remember the first meeting we had, we were playing Canada at Eden Park in, the, in, in March of 95 before the World Cup. And he put his hand up at the first meeting. And I was like, wow, 
no, it's, you only just got on the team. You know, what, what, yeah. what, and it was fantastic. And he said to me, he said, uh, he said, Fitzy, he's Ryan in the morning. I thought, I said, oh, because we've, we've done that for the last hundred years, Mertz. He said, but yeah, we, we play in the afternoon and in the evenings. So what are the playing mornings? It was like, yeah, okay, good point. You know, I was thinking, well, play in the morning so we can play golf in the afternoon, Mertz. Um, <laughs> But, the official answer. But I think it's really, and that's what I love, and 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 being back here and and watching the All Blacks on TV and and seeing the young kids, the um, Hosking Satutu and, and Caleb Clark, these young kids that have come out of Super Rugby Aotearoa and just burst onto the scene have been given an opportunity. But do you know what I love, Matt? They're smiling. They're having a go. And yeah. and what that says to me is that Sam Kane, the captain, has created that environment along with Ian Foster, the coach. They've created this environment where everyone's everyone's into it. You know, if they make a mistake, we're not going to shame you. We're not going to shame you. We're going to work it out. We're going to you know, make sure you don't make that mistake again, but we're going to make, make you a better player. And that's what is so important, you know, Pick the right people, then then turn them into great All Blacks, and that's you know I can, which is great for me as a past All Black, to see that that legacy is is continuing. D- d- definitely, and, and it it's great to think of, of a team having that kind of ethos of, of of you know not blaming people, but working towards making people well make, making better people, um, ultimately, and and. I think from certainly from a business world, one of the best books I, I, I ever read was um, now escapes me, uh, but it's by a guy called uh, Matthew Saeed, and it's about oh, playing. Yes, yeah. And, and um, for the life of me, I can't remember the book. I'll put it in the link out of the video afterwards. But it, you know, the examples of, of different industries and, and how they look at things that go wrong, and one is very much a blame culture. One is very much a learning culture. Um, and they've changed things so that those things don't happen again. So it's great to see that in a sports team because you all, always think of sports teams. You know, you, you look at um, you look at Wales at the moment. You know, not performing, you know, brilliantly well, yeah. and the media and the fans are already calling for for blood. And, and you know, it, it's a case of the teams really being together that five minutes, realistically, coaching staff, and and you know, everything's got to be given time to to grow and gel together. Um, which is quite. It's very quite much. A... I'm I'm a big fan in terms of of the players having a. You know, I I, I look at uh, there's a guy called Owen Eastwood who's a performance coach. He's um, he's brilliant. You just listen to some of him stuff. He's a, he's a New Zealander who works with with some of the major sporting teams around the world in terms of yeah. performance coaching. And he he uses a great example of of that environment where you're not shaming people and. Uh, was the World Cup in 2011 uh, when the All Blacks? I think it was the night of the, the the week of the semi-final. I think it was uh, Corey Jane and Israel Dag went out on a Monday night and yeah. and got into trouble. Maybe had a few too many drinks or whatever they did. They they got into trouble and the media was sort of jumping all over it. And the senior players, not the management, not the lawyers. The senior players in the All Blacks handled it. They dealt with it. Totally unacceptable. But the senior players or the, the team dealt with it, you know? Yeah. And that was it. And it was dealt with properly. Uh, where, where other teams, uh, you know, in the papers, you know, bringing in judges, bringing in this, bringing in that, trial by media, um, which, is, which is not... Not the right way to do it, and and ultimately, um, it pays dividends. But it's all very easy saying this. Yeah, the All Black environment is is, is one where that is a hugely successful environment. Um, but it it's it's a work on. It's consistently trying to get better. And you know, the way we were doing yesterday's the way we were doing yesterday is not good enough to win tomorrow. So keep challenging yourself. And I always say to people, when you're the best at what you do, like yourself, Matt. Um, everyone, everyone is trying to trying to knock you off. Yeah. Um, so every every game you play is a World Cup final because the opposition is playing like a World Cup final. Yeah. So you need everyone on the team 
uh, right through the management. Um, you know, we, we talk we talk about this country as, as one team, basically. You know, the, the shareholders are, are, are the nation. The residents of, of, of New Zealand or passport holders of New Zealand are the shareholders of our organisation. They are our tribe. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've got a responsibility to them. Fantastic. Now, I mean, you, you've name dropped loads of people, you know, Zinzan, all, all of those. One thing I wanted to ask you about, maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, you played in the 95 World Cup where Lomu literally like ran yeah. over everyone. And, and, you know, I think the Underwood brothers never recovered from, from any of that. Um, and it, it was, you know, a fearsome competition. But it also became an iconic World Cup as well for, for what was happening in South Africa with apartheid and Nelson Mandela and, and everything. You know, was there a sense of, you know, something special happening there? I, I know that there have always been, been rumours and, and whispers of food poisoning and, and shenanigans going on behind the scenes before you took the pitch for the final. But, but what was it like to, to kind of play in that kind of moment of history that, that uh, yeah, it's just gone down in history? Obviously, the result didn't quite go your way. I understand. Yeah, I, you know, that... No. Uh, no, <laughs> well, I'm sort of, I'm sort of getting over it, Matt. You know, there's, a, there's not many days that go by that I don't think about it, but I've been told uh, I will, I will get over it and sort of move on. But yeah, it was a, and when you, you know, when you look back, and even, even during the World Cup, you could see there was something special was happening. It was a, you know, the greatest World Cup I'd, I'd played in. I, I played yeah. in three World Cups, and without question, that was the, the one that. You know, it went to it went to another level in terms of of the venues. I, I love playing rugby in South Africa. They're they're rugby mad. Uh, they know they know their sport. Um, great grounds, um, and it was a brilliant brilliant World Cup. And you know, to play in that final, and you know, I look back and I you know, I think if we'd done things differently, if we you know, after our game against against the English down at, at Newlands, you know, we had had the most unbelievable performance. Um, it was a culmination, I suppose, of, you know, we, in 92, Laurie Main said to us, we need to be the fittest and fastest uh, team in the world if we're going to win the World Cup in 95 because we're going to be playing on hard grounds. Uh, we're, we're going to be based up at the high belt um, and we need the fittest forward pack and we need the fastest wingers uh, because we're going to play this game that is this expansive, wide game that the world's never seen before. And, and we did that. I, I went to that World Cup as fit as I'd ever been. Um, you know, the, the, we, had a, we had a camp in, in January down this down in sort of middle of New Zealand in a place called Taupo. And it was the hardest camp I've ever been to. Uh, unfortunately, Jonah, uh, we didn't, well, the players didn't know he had a kidney disorder. Uh, he couldn't load any fitness. He couldn't do what we were doing. And he got, he got moved aside. Um, so we had the fittest and fastest team in the world and we had these two nippy wingers that were going to score tries and one was called Jeff Wilson and the other one was Eric Rush and, and, and it was brilliant and we, we thought okay unfortunately for Russia he got injured and they literally had to drag Jonah off the plane that was going to Japan to play sevens and you know and we came to the World Cup uh, went through the full games and just, just set the world on fire and we we weren't rated very highly in those days, Matt. We had a pretty disastrous 94. And I think we were rated three, four, maybe even fifth in the world. So we were sort of under the radar a bit. And quarterfinal played played Scotland at, at Pretoria. Uh, once again, did it again. Jonah scored tries. Um, but it was more a... Jonah's, uh, and, and may he rest in peace, his most beautiful man. And, and he was very humble. Yeah, this, this was nothing to him. He was just finishing things off. Uh, he's shy and he expressed himself on the field, and that's and that's what he was doing. And you know, we went down to, to Newlands, and we had a we had a bit of bit of history with that game because in '93 we'd lost him at Twickenham to to basically this English team, and this this English team that we were playing against was a world class team, you know, right from Rob Andrew, Carling. Um, you know, the Jason Leonard, Moro, you know, Johnson, you know, just players that were were world class and, and they were huge. They had a massive forward pack. 
and yeah. and we weren't big uh, but we 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 got the jump on them and and you know history you know the game was probably over you know 30 minutes into the game um, went back up to up to uh, Johannesburg that night yeah and literally everything changed from being you know the greatest world cup that I'd ever been to all of a sudden <laughs> the siege mentality, which I've seen here in New Zealand in 2011, in terms of winning a World Cup, uh, yeah. the home nation definitely has an advantage. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, we just everything changed for us. You know, we couldn't leave the hotel, we couldn't drive down the road, um, but we, we were fine. We just had to get on with it. And probably the worst mistake we made was we had lunch uh, by ourselves in our team room, uh, where we'd been eating in the main restaurant throughout the whole week. On the Thursday and you know, on Friday morning, I think 16 of the 21 players couldn't get out of bed um, with food poisoning. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the, the question's always been, was it on purpose or not? I, I don't know. Um, by Saturday, I think, you know, you know, we didn't train on Friday, obviously, and went to the stadium, who, who was able to go to the stadium. And then on Saturday, I... Uh, I think Jeff Wilson was the only player that was still vomiting. Um, but the, the 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 moment that I'll never forget is when when Nelson Mandela walked down that tunnel uh, wearing yeah. Francois's jersey, and um, you know it was just mind blowing that atmosphere, that, that electricity that filled that stadium mm. with Nelson Mandela walking onto the stadium as they chanted Madiba, Madiba, and I thought, wow, wow, that yeah. is so powerful. And and the game, you know, it could have gone either way. You know, Mertz missed a yeah. drop kick in the last minute of real time. Um, it went to extra time, and 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 Joel got the the kick that you know will go down in history. So you know, life changing experience. You know, we were devastated because um, it was a, an opportunity that was missed. Yeah. Um, but that's life. And you know, I, I had a had a had a real special moment. In June this year, uh, a few of the guys have become good mates with the South African guys. Uh, they had their reunion. Uh, they had a Zoom Zoom reunion uh, nice. for that team, and on the on that day in, in June 1995, and, and, and uh, we and they invited me to join them as a sacrificial lamb <laughs> in the uh, middle. But it was brilliant. Yeah, you know, we've I've become good mates with Francois, and, and you know. Mark Andrews and, and Russo and uh, just good people. They're very similar to us. That's why we have this huge respect for the South Africans. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and no disrespect to everyone else, but they're, you know, for me personally, they're our greatest foe. Uh, they always cause me the most headaches. Uh, they, just, <laughs> they, just don't, they just don't go away. They just keep yeah. knocking on the door. Um, but yeah, that was a, a special World Cup. And then to, to see what it did to the nation how it united the nation and, and then to be in, in, in Yokohama last year with Francois. And he said, Fitzy, he said, this, this is bigger than 95. He said, you wait till, till when Sia takes this cup back to South Africa, what that will do for a nation. And, you know, the stuff that we do for Laureus um, just spells it out louder than ever that sport unites a nation. Yeah. Sport unites people. Um, oh, definitely. Which is which is so so true in all kinds of sport. Oh, de de definitely, and and you know it, it's it's. I know it's, it might be it's still a little bit of a painful memory, but thanks for talking to us about that. That was it's, it's, it's actually it's, a, it's actually not a painful memory. It's just a you know because the one that got away. You know, yeah. That's the that's the that's the annoying thing, and you know. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get. I, I, you know, I won a few games, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just being greedy. <laughs> We'd always like that one extra win, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Yeah. But I mean, you, you say you won a few games. I mean, the All Blacks have a tremendous win rate. Um, when you look at other sports and and you just look at what the All Blacks have achieved, it's almost like the All Blacks have this aura around them that you've almost lost the game before you even started it because you're playing the All Blacks. Can, can, can somebody who's on the other side of that, can you explain that? Why, why are the All Blacks seen as, as this, this juggernaut of a team? I can, I can guarantee you, Matt, we do not think like that. We, we don't yeah. think that we have a, an aura. Um, that aura is, is earned. 
Uh, yeah. And, and that's that's the responsibility of everyone who takes that jersey on, um, that you've got to make it a better jersey than what you found it in. And yeah. why, why, why do we have this great legacy and how, how do we sustain this culture of success? Because um, we demand it. We demand it of each other. Um, yeah. You know, to play for the All Blacks, you, you have to live in New Zealand. And, and hopefully that will continue. Um, yeah. You know, obviously the, the pressure is really coming on the New Zealand Rugby Union now in terms of finances, um, because the guys that play for the All Blacks could probably earn, you know, one and a half, two times more than what they're earning here if they played in other parts of the world. But that, that may change after, after, after COVID hopefully moves on. Yeah. Um, so getting that All Black jersey is, as I said, a responsibility. And, and you've got to work hard. And yeah. Because if, if you're not doing the job, there's somebody else who will do the job. And, uh, and you just got to know, you know, what you're, what you're taking on really. And that's why, yeah, you talk about preparation and sacrifice. That's, that's why we're good. Because yeah. uh, we work hard. And it's, it's, it's not easy. You've got to work hard. And it's like anything in life, Matt. If you want to, you know, if you want to be good at anything, you've got to work hard. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, either don't work hard or or they don't don't realize their potential and and, yeah. and that's what i love about about our sport is that you you can work hard um, everyone can be fit you know you look at teams and i you know who was, who was i watching recently that that have done really well say say wasps in yeah. the premiership i think their coach i'm just trying to think of his name but but he, when uh, he took over lee, that lee they, they, yeah lee blackett he said he said look we haven't got the skill sets of some teams. We haven't got this. We haven't got that. We haven't got the size or this. He said, but what we do have is we can get fit. Yeah. We can be the fittest team in the premiership. And, and when you look at them, the, the work rate of those guys. Uh, yeah. And purely because that's, that's one thing you can, can have control of is how fit you are. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe some people can work on their skills, but they're never going to be able to pass, pass off their left hand or something as well as they can pass up their right hand. Yeah. But fitness, you can definitely control that. Um, so just things like that are, you know, and that's, you know, it's, you got to work hard. It's a, it's a, it's not a nine to five job this being, a, being a rugby player. You know, no. it's, it's, you know, as we say, you know, before you do anything, ask yourself, is it good for the team? What you are about to do, you know? Yeah. Now, now, you know, you said you know is it good for the team and things like that and, you, and you've thrown the word legacy out a, a few times now I'm sure you're aware of of, of the book legacy uh, about lessons for uh, in business about the all blacks by um, James Kerr and and there's lots of good stuff in there and I, I think some of the stuff that you've alluded to probably comes back to one of my my favorite bits of the book uh, and one of the policies of the all blacks and that's a no dickheads allowed rule Um and, and, and it's so, so true of, of it's all for the team. It's all for the progress of, of, of the team. You know, you can't have the, the prima donnas and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And, and, and again, the leadership and, and everything, you know, you said about Corey Jane and, um, and going out for a few beers and the senior players dealt with it because they know how important everything is. And I, and I think, yeah, that, that goes towards, you know, the aura of the All Blacks is the fact that, you know, the guy, everybody comes across as really humble and, and doing everything for the yeah, team. I, you know, I think you know, is a is a massive part of, of successful people because unfortunately, when, once, once you become successful, probably the first thing that, that will rear its nasty head is, is a bit of arrogance. Um, but when you live in a country like this, you get you get knocked down to, to size pretty pretty quickly and you know obviously the the all blacks talk about it you know the no dickhead policy that's you know I, you know we don't have one time all blacks now matt um yeah. be, because you know the identification process is really good you know we play in a country where there's only 250 professional players um they play against each other all the time they know each other the the, the selectors are watching them the whole time um, so they they know which 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 kids are going to be the good ones and which which are the ones that are going to you know slide slide by yeah um, so they'll they may into those those kids that aren't 
aren't living up to their potential, they'll, they'll throw a bit of time at them, give them an opportunity. And, and if they don't take that opportunity, we move on. Yeah. And that's, and that's why. So, I, you know, the no dickhead policy, I, I, you know, in the All Blacks, they, they, they wouldn't even get to first base now in terms of the way the the way the sure, selection sure. process goes um which is good but you know you, you talk about that legacy and and that's really big for us mm. we we talk about the history of our organization um we, we talk about dave gallagher our our first all black captain um who, who died in the first world war you know we go we go to his grave uh, when we come to this part well, so when we when we come to europe the boys will make a trip to go to his gravesite uh, where, where he died. And um, that's really important to know who's been before us. You know, yeah. I, I grew up idolizing and loving, loving the All Blacks and to, to meet an All Black, to touch an All Black um, was something you could do. And, and that is still so important and that, that we have heroes um, and I don't call them role models. I said we have heroes. Uh, sure, they have responsibilities, but the role models are the parents and the and the carers of the children, not 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 the you know the Sam Keynes of the world and the Bowden, Bowden Barrett's have responsibility, but the parents are the role models. Um, but I I like being able to go to the supermarket and being able to see Bowden Barrett signing an autograph for a kid or having a photo in the supermarket while he's getting his groceries, which is right. is so important. And that's yeah. that's a humility thing, you know. They're, they're way more special than anyone else. Um, sure, they've got a, they've got a God given talent, but ultimately, they're just like you and I, Matt. <laughs> let, 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 let's face it. There's a difference between you and fellow I. front <laughs> rowers, Matt. Fellow front <laughs> rowers. <laughs> exactly. But do, do you think that that's one of the unique things about rugby, though, is the accessibility of the players? I mean, I I remember. Um, going down to, to, to Stradi for a weekend and, and go, popping into Tesco's and seeing the uh, the Tongan winger and, and legend Celesi for now, you know, picking up some oranges and, and just, you know, stopping and, and you know, yeah, having a chat because I'd, I'd seen him the day before, had a photo with him, and all of a sudden he's just in Tesco's. Um, do you think that's that's one of the unique things about rugby compared to things <laughs> like football? It is not, not that, you know... That, we shop at Tesco's and, and, and places like that, but the fact that the players are are accessible. Yeah, I, I think they're accessible because because ultimately, Matt, you know, even even in today's game with this, with what they get paid, ultimately they all they all have to, to find a job once once they retire doing something. Yeah, you know, ultimately there's 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 a very small percentage of them that that won't need to work too hard. And there's a percentage of them that will get TV work, or but the majority of them will have to have to find a job. Yeah, and and I think that's quite humbling that you know you have to actually think about it during your career. Mm. Um, you have to learn how to deal with people. You have to learn a, a trade or a, or a profession, um, and, that, and that rounds you. And that's what I think in, in terms of the amateur game. And I played in the amateur game and professional game. To be honest, I don't think there was any difference other than we got paid a lot yeah. more money. And and that's the nice thing. We and that's what I love about about our game. And it's, you know, at the Scarlets, at Harlequins, at the All Blacks, at the Blues team, at Auckland. Um, they're they're all people um, that you they have, have that community-based love of rugby. Um, hugely professional and all those teams I've mentioned but you know what Matt there's a little bit of old school there which which I love that old school I like I, yeah like I even like seeing the the managers you know watching on on TV you know wearing a suit and tie sitting in the coach's box yeah you know, it's it's just something that you know it's a bit of old school it's yeah. nice you know um, or yeah, or, it's not all, or all the coaches in the all the yeah you know, and, and, and I love the way they, 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 you get given a cap when you played a hundred tests or, or whatever. And there was a beautiful piece that you probably didn't see um, in the UK after the Australians, when the Australians beat us. Um, it was Slipper, the prop, it was his hundredth game. And 
and after the game, because uh, Sam came and him had had a bit of a tussle on the ground during the game. But after the game, just in a quiet little on the sideline, this is probably half an hour after the game, um, Sam Kane presented them with a, a bottle of New Zealand wine and they had a hug. I saw, saw something know. like that, yeah. Which is just absolutely brilliant. I, I, I just love that about our game. And it, yeah. it happens in other sport, of course it does. Um, but we, we can't afford to lose that. It's that, that human touch um, that, is, that is so, so important. Yeah, and, and and again, I think that that is really important about the game. I mean, I, I, there's there's one team in particular when I when I was still playing, where I'd come up against a prop, we'd have a bit of a ding dong on the pitch, and and but he'd always be the first person to buy me a pint in the bar afterwards, and we'd always have a chat before the game and after the game, during the game is business time. Afterwards, doesn't really matter. Yeah. It, right. it, it's all good. But one thing you mentioned there about you know, players coming away from the game afterwards and, and you know, having to get another <laughs> career. What happened when you retired? Because I know, I know you're a very, very busy man now, but what happened when you retired? Or was it all <laughs> of a sudden all, all and then nothing? I feel like I'd always, always worked um, and, and different, different things. I, you know, I'm a builder by trade. Um, so, so my wife and I had, had done done a few developments and a few houses and things, and so there was always that um, to do. And even you know, even and when I was um, you know ninety six, ninety seven, I was I was building houses. That's that's what we did. Yeah. And and I sort of you know ninety seven when I got injured, I'd never been injured. I'd never never had a knee injury or anything really. I just you know, had operations to to clean things out and that sort of stuff. But it never never ever prevented me from playing. And and to have that knee injury in ninety seven, I, I was still um, in denial really. And you know even I, you know when I walked off that game in in uh, ninety seven at, at Wembley, and I said to Zinzan, I said Jesus, Zinny. I said, I can't do what I, I used to be able to do because there's bloody knee. And he said, Fitzy, he said, you need to retire. And I was like, that's not quite the answer I was looking for, Zinni. And then I, you know, and I went out, out to dinner with, with John Hart, the All Black coach on Monday night, as we had done every other week, just to sort of talk about planning for the rest of the week and, and you know, discuss the team. And he said, uh, Fitzy, he said, let's, uh, before we go any further... <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're not playing on Saturday. He said, uh, you're retiring. And I was like, no, no, hearty, no, no. And he said, nah, you've got to retire. And honestly, it was the, and I said, look, give me six months to get it right. And literally, and that was the end of it. And uh, it was the hardest decision I've ever made. Yeah. Uh, just purely because I, I suppose that, that fear of failure, I always talk about as a player, we always had a fear of failure. Um, so, so how do you harness that fear of failure? You become better. You train harder and, and you take all that, that fear of failure out of it. So you've harnessed the fear of failure, basically. And, and I think me letting go was like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to go to work. Um, or I'm going to have to, you know, how am I going to support the, you know, all those sort of things go through your mind. But I, so I, I ended up um, doing some work with New Zealand rugby. Um, I managed the the under twenty ones uh, for three years. Uh, I managed the the Blues uh, rugby team for for three years. Um, so that sort of kept me involved. I I set up the RPA, the Rugby Players Association, which we didn't have in those days. Uh, yeah. I I employed Rob Nickel, who who is now still the the RPA um, guy here in New Zealand, uh, who's done a fantastic job. Um, so that that was really pleasing. And then, and then, and we continued to do a bit of building here and there, and and then in two thousand and four, my wife and I decided we needed to have a bit of a overseas experience. Uh, so, so we took the children and and we 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 sold up and we moved to the UK for two years, um, and that was that was almost twenty years ago or seventeen years ago. So we're still there, still loving it, um, and you know, and 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 enjoying life. Keeping busy. Well, well, of course you're keeping busy. You've now just taken on one of the biggest roles. You know, joined one of the biggest teams in 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 world rugby, the Scarlets. We'll forget about Harlequins and and all of those. So, what? How how did that happen? Because 
as as a as a Scarlets fan, that was well and truly out of the left field. Um, yeah. When it was announced that you were joining, <laughs> it, it was a case of rereading, loading the article again, going, "Is this right?" So, so how how did yeah, that yeah. come about? I'm sure. I'm sure my father would be turning in his grave thinking that I'd gone back to Kinesley. I wasn't going to mention the 9-3. To... <laughs> yeah, the 9-3, yes, exactly. Um, it, it came about, I'd, it came about at the, you know, the start of lockdown, basically, and I'd, I'd, I'd done a few things, uh, a few TV shows over here, and I've been on multiple podcasts about rugby post-COVID. And and I was really positive about about the reset button, about you know what has happened is and this is I'm, I'm, everyone's spoken about this how what what has happened to rugby now is is something that was going to happen anyway that this yeah. is just COVID's accelerated what was going to happen basically, and and I, I kept looking at it thinking I'm really optimistic about where rugby's going because um, we need to change and yeah. and then. And then the Scarlet's opportunity came along and I thought, yeah, okay. I was there 25 years ago uh, when the game went professional and, and I had an input into, into where, where the, the structures, how, how the game would, would pan out. Yeah. Um, and I haven't had much other than working in TV and, and, and working with Harlequins. I haven't had any, I've got two girls, so uh, we love rugby. I just I, I love everything about it. I love going to watch it uh, and working on TV and rugby, going to the World Cups um, has been brilliant. But I, I thought the Scarlet's opportunity and and Harlequins was an opportunity to to maybe shape where we're going in the next next twenty five years. Yeah. And um, so that happened, and then we we sort of dug into it. Um, as as I said last time, I was in Kinetley, it was. Uh, Clanethley, I've got to get that right because I, I had a bit of <laughs> have an issue on uh, that, it's, that, it, that it's not not with a C, it's Clanethley, I think. Um, you'll have to, you'll have to <laughs> sort of help me there, Matt. We'll re and redub it. I hadn't been back there since 1989. And, and then getting to know the Scarlets, um, getting to know their structures, getting to know their ambitions, um, getting to know the way the board had, had run um, the team, um, getting to know some of the players, and then and then looking at what World Rugby was trying to do in terms of the calendar, um, yeah. I saw it as a as a wonderful fit and a, and an opportunity to work with a club that had had big ambitions and had a, had a, had a very passionate board. Um, it's a real community based club. Uh, got great fans, uh, as we call them the, in New Zealand. We call them the tribe. Yeah. Um, and and it's exciting. I'm I'm really really enjoying it. And you know you know I know you interviewed Simon last week, and he he is doing a, a brilliant job. Uh, he's energised, and and I think that's and we sort of play off each other really well. And you know we're we're both in a position that that we can give it a lot of time, which it, it needs um, at at the moment, and. Um, and we're enjoying it. So, yeah, we want to be at the top table. So can you discuss some of your, your ideas and, and plans for the Scarlets or, or is, is that a step step beyond? No. Um, I'm, obviously, the, the playing side is quite important to me. I'm, yep. I'm, you know, in terms of uh, what Glenn Delaney and, and his coaching team are doing, that's, I'm, I'm really interested in that, obviously. Um, I, I'm interested in the alumni, uh, which is something I, I don't think we've done really well, at, very well at the Scarlets, uh, in terms of the Dave Gallagher's from from, from say from a, an All Black analogy, um, you know, you know some some of my childhood heroes, uh, uh, our Welshman and you know the Phil Bennett's of the world, who who was our president. Um, you know, they need to be more involved. You know, the, the Yay and Evans of the world, the Scott Cornells, the Derek Cornells, um, you know, these sort of players who, who are just huge idols and huge names in, in, in world rugby, not let alone just Scarlet's rugby. Um, you know, we need to, to make sure that we, we tap into that. And, and, you know, I like the alumni. 
I like I like seeing them around around part to Scarlets. You know, yeah. they should be there. Um, they should have an area where they can they can come and 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 press the flesh. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's the alumni. Um, you know, working on the board is 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 um, is, a, is a, you know in terms of of me sort of contributing there as as an area in terms of especially the rugby side um, in terms of pushing our brand globally. Uh, that's an area I can can help with. Um, opening doors, as I think Simon said last last week, I, I opened the door and I I let, I let him in, um, <laughs> uh, which is which is we seem we seem to do that well together. And obviously the the relationship with New Zealand um, is something that we need to to really tap into because the history is you know the history yeah. back in you know seventy two and you know even eighty nine and all, all those games um, is is huge, um, and as I said, Welsh rugby in New Zealand is is very much, especially my generation. That you know that that Lions team that came to New Zealand in the early seventies, you know, had the, had a, had an effect on on a generation of kids. You know, Grant Fox yeah. started kicking around the corner because Barry John kicked around the corner. I tried to be like Gareth Edwards, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and then seventy seven when you know the Phil Bennett came to came to New Zealand you know all those things are, are are so important so if we can can tap into that and and I know Simon spoke about that last week in terms of the work that, that John Daniels and 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 Simon and and has done with with New Zealand rugby and trying to sort of trying to plan something uh you know for you know 2022 yeah um, it would be phenomenal oh it'd be, be, be awesome I'll definitely be tapping you and Simon up for tickets then so so what else what else is sean fitzpatrick up to because you always seem very busy with tv work and, and everything else so <laughs> um, yeah how, how many more plates uh, are you spinning at the moment uh, not not too many matt at the moment it's, it's a bit quiet at the moment uh with, with covid um but i i do a lot of public speaking well I used to do a lot of public speaking motivational speaking and that's uh, at the moment that's not happening yeah um so uh you know there's 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 literally we've been in lockdown basically we've been out of our house just outside London since since March basically um you know working working from home and and you know uh, so yeah that's 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 the gig at the moment uh, not a not a, a lot going on, but I'm you know I'm, I'm busy enough. Uh, you know the gardens never look better. I, I painted the house uh, inside and out. Uh, I lost about ten kilos. <laughs> <laughs> but your arms are super no, strong now. You know we're we're obviously optimistic in terms of where where COVID's going, and you know the soon yeah. The sooner that we can get crowds back into the stadiums, uh, the better, and then we can get on doing what we're doing. Because, as I said, there's only so long we can continue with with no crowds. We could talk forever and a day about your, your history and your passion for the game and 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 everything that you're doing, but I always ask people three tips that they can pass on to people, uh, three business tips that they would give, as your experience as as a, one of the legendary All Blacks. What would you say are your three tips? Uh, okay. Um, okay. Um, treat everyone as an equal. I, I really, I'm really big on that. That, um, and that I suppose by doing that, you're creating a safe environment where people can express themselves. Um, the second one is is to have an attitude when you get out of bed in the morning that I'm going to be better than what I was yesterday. Yeah. Um, that I'm going to, that I'm going to add value. I, I'm not going to lose this day. Um, I'm going to I'm going to really add value. So it's that's a, a real attitude. That's something you can control. Yeah. Your attitude, how you turn up to work. Um, so just as soon as you get out of bed, just say I'm going to be better than what I was yesterday. So how do I do I that? Like that. Smile, yeah, I like that. Whatever, and then and then finally, Matt, 
which is sort of our, our mantra really, uh, which we, we try and live by, is be the best you can be. Um, everything you do, um, you know, we talk, we talk about winning a lot and, and winning is important. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't talk about it enough um, to be the best they can be. Uh, and if you have an attitude that you want to be the best in the world at what you do, um, you got to work hard. And unfortunately, um, enough people don't say that I want to be a winner. And it's not a bad word. It is not a bad word. Yeah, uh, I'm not talking about cheating, but I'm talking about saying I want to win. And when you say to children, you know, I want you to go down to the park, have a great time with your mates, have fun, but win. And then all of a sudden, little Sean, his mind changes. And little Matt, because they think, okay, I'm going to have fun with my mates, I'm going to play well. How do, how do I win? Ah, I've got to learn how to kick the ball off the both, my both feet. I've got to learn how to pass off both hands. And then if you don't win, as it is in the All Blacks, if you don't win, at least we know we've tried our best. At least yeah. we've turned every bloody stone over and thought, how do we, how do we get better? And, and ultimately, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm fat and lazy. Or maybe I need to try a different sport. Um, and it's the same in every walk of life. So, you know, being equal, treat everyone as equal, have a great attitude and be the best you can be. I think that's, that'll create a pretty good life. That's brilliant. I, I, I love that, especially, you know, get out of bed and, and you know, today is going to be better than yesterday because, yeah. And, and I think winning, the, the, the word winning can sometimes be a bit of a dirty I'm word doing in a, some circles. I'm, I'm doing I'm doing a lot of that at the moment, Matt, here in quarantine. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, 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 you've you got to, kind of, otherwise you go stir crazy. Do I look crazy? <laughs> no, not at all, mate, not at all. But it's only day nine. Give it another couple of days. <laughs> Very good, Matt. Thank you. It's been a been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us, Sean, and, and hopefully we can get you on for another episode in, in, in another uh, next series. But um, thanks for everybody for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, stay tuned for more episodes. <laughs>